Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 739. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 28th, 2022. Thank you for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted. You know, we're recording here Tuesday morning. A lot is going on, and uh, I've noticed there's a lot of new viewers, so we need to reintroduce ourselves. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm a layperson in the Anglican Church in North America. This is George Conger. He is a priest in the Diocese of Central Florida in the Episcopal Church. Every week, we try to sit down once or twice uh a week at least, turn on the webcams, click the record button, and, and tell people what's happening in this world, especially uh, try and be more transparent about the news, let you know both sides of the story, and uh, that's getting more and more traction. We appreciate you clicking into us. If you want to learn more about Anglican uh, uh, Unscripted and Anglican TV and Anglican.inc, you can go to the Anglican.inc website, and we uh, duplicate the news we talk about here. Or we duplicate the news we print there, here. It, it, it's all the same, George. How are you doing this week? Well, fine, but I want to ask about you, because the back of your head, there are little puffs of smoke going by every so often. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, is there a, the are you in a forest <laughs> fire? Or? No, who knows? You know, we, we got new camper neighbors yesterday, and uh, they're, they're the type of people who come in, and they, they put up the little pop-up. And they, they take everything out of the camper, put it on the little uh, picnic table in front of them. And then they sit around the campfire all day long, eight, nine hours. They were sitting out here yesterday, George. And all they did was look at their iPhones all day. <laughs> the, the, the two girls, they didn't talk to each other once the whole time. I'm like, that's not camping. How are you going to have life-changing, memorable experiences camping like my father provided to our family? Every time we took a camping trip anywhere, Dad forgot something that was essential to camping, <laughs> whether it be fire sticks or the camera or the that that primary tent pole that held everything up. You know that those are life changing life element experiences that everybody needs to hear, and everybody needs I, to experience. I thought your I thought your experiences with camping always involved trips to the emergency room. I mean, <laughs> yes. it was well, a that's good dad, yes. chopping wood. <laughs> Okay. Yes, that Dad um, probably has more uh, hospital uh, ER visits than most men ever should have because I'm not as clumsy as he is, but I am clumsy. Knowing how clumsy I am uh, explains Dad very well. Uh, many ERs. The the most fun thing about growing up with Dad is um, his primary job, according to Mom, was to bring the camera and have the camera ready to take pictures for Christmas, for July 4th, for Thanksgiving, Easter, all the holidays where the cousins were going to get together. Dad's responsibility was to bring the camera. And every time, he would forget the film or he would forget the batteries. And we took a trip, <laughs> in, we took a trip, and this is a long time ago, 1976 to Florida. He brought the batteries. He brought enough film for the whole trip. He's taking all these pictures. Mom is so proud of him. Two weeks ago, into everything all over Disney, and we were, we got out of a one of those uh, um, Gator boats, the the big fans on the back, um, air boats. Air boat, uh, we, yeah. Yeah, we'd taken one of those tours. He's getting out, and he drops the camera bag between the boat and the dock. He's just six <laughs> to the <line. laughs> That's dad. Oh, <laughs> so you guys need to have those experiences. Get off your iPhones out there, whippersnappers. Oh. So yeah, it is what it is. Well, um, so, they're sitting out in the sun for eight hours. And some people may say, George, you're really spotty today. Well, I had uh, 22 uh, skin cancer lesions taken off. My every six month check, you know, <laughs> slice and dice, a few biopsies, mm -hmm. uh, but 22 plus uh, freezes with the cryogenic freezing gun or whatever it is. Uh, so I'm just a massive spots today. So no, I do not have monkey pox. No, no, no. I have yeah. dermatologist pox. <laughs> That's right. You have precancerous uh, uh, cyber pox. Um, so that that's just us growing old. I'm 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 nit nitpicking the campers next to me, and George is getting his, his cancer cells to reboot. Wow, we're fifty. George, let's move on to the news. Now, this is a great time to be a Christian YouTuber, to be able to sit down and talk about the news that's happening in the nation and around the world, because it's taken a dramatic twist. 
And a lot of people say, you know, we voted for Donald Trump because he promised us uh, he would change the, the makeup of the Supreme Court if given the chance. Now, there's a lot not to like about Donald Trump. I'm just going to say that. I did not vote for him. I, I was not able to uh, plug my nose and vote um, just f for whatever reason. For those of you who were able to, you have reaped the rewards uh, as far as um, the legal context of Christianity in this nation. And we've had Supreme Court decision, uh, almost four of them now, that are ex extremely original intent and extremely pro-Christian uh, in intent. And we sh we've talked about a, a couple of them already. We've talked about Roe v. Wade and others. But let's talk a little bit more about um, what came down yesterday with the Kennedy case. Uh, a football coach was fired because he took it upon himself after a game to go to the 50-yard line, kneel. He didn't protest the, the national anthem. He didn't protest uh, um, the the evils going around the world. He sat there and invoked God uh, upon himself and those who would gather around him. Wow. But he got fired for that, George. The court said you can't do that. He was fired because he was breaching the line between church and state. He was mm -hmm. a state employee, a school employee, as a football coach. And by praying with other people at a voluntary gathering after a game that had nothing to do with the game, nothing to do with his coaching job, uh, he was fired. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court held that he, his right to free expression and free assembly was paramount. And no, he was just as a Black Lives Matter protester at a football game can get it down on one knee, or Colin Kaepernick can do all these things when he does these things. So can this man, after the game, not in the context of his employment, but in the context of sort of the fun after a game, can give thanks to Jesus Christ for the camaraderie, <clears throat> the, the fun that they had, and, and the lessons of sportsmanship and teamwork that they learned uh, playing football. And this is a remarkable pushback against the government worry wards who see any expression of faith in any aspect of the public square as an impermissible breaching of the boundary between church and state. Now, the boundary between church and state was originally set up so that we did not have a Church of England established in the United States. And remember, in the first two, three decades of the, this country, there were established churches in Virginia, in Maryland, in other places. Anglicans were the established church after the revolution in Virginia, sure. for example, okay. and, in, and in Manhattan and so forth. But over time, those were all dropped. It was not the federal government's job to have a national church where we could censor other people's religious expressions. And so the U.S. Supreme Court is basically going back to the Constitution and not allowing the fads of the previous hundred plus years to be paramount. So, and the other ruling, there was a smaller, less noticed ruling that in many ways follows the same line. Um, there'd been a recent spate of doctors going to jail for prescribing opiates, basically dealing, you know, le semi legal drug dealing, uh, pain management doctors over prescribing oxycodone and things like that. Uh, it's giving somebody a 10-year supply or whatever. Right. Well, those guys are arrested by the DEA and, and whatnot. Well, this has had a ripple-on effect in the pain management area, where pain management doctors now have to show that they, are do they have the burden of proof on themselves when giving out narcotics. And a, uh, an American doctor of Chinese ancestry, I can't remember his name, was arrested for prescribing narcotics and he said this is my con concern uh, considered medical opinion that this person needs this narcotic to treat their pain and the state government said no nope, sorry and the DEA said nope sorry we think that's too much the federal US Supreme Court said no if the doctor is doing this uh, it, to treat a patient the burden of proof that he's now abusing his medical license lies with the state. The doctor doesn't have to prove he's doing the right thing. It's the state. Now, this will have a knock-on effect 
remember during the height of COVID, doctors who were prescribing ivermectin and other uh, therapies were threatened with jail. Well, if they were doing this to make money, then they would go to jail. But if they were doing this because in their considered medical opinion, this was a preferable treatment option, then the state has no right to say no, unless the state can prove otherwise. Well, now, the what Supreme ties all this stuff together? Sure. I just want to say it's freedom, freedom. Oh, freedom, or, or the, you know, the Supreme Court is saying the state is not your doctor. Your mm -hmm. doctor is your doctor, and we will refer to them uh, even though there, yeah, there's there's corruption in uh, the field. There are people who had pill mills. Uh, I remember, you know, watching uh, a documentary once of all these little billboards going down I-75 in Florida for these pain uh, centers where you would go in and you, they would prescribe you, uh, way over prescribe you the the medicine because that you were paying them. Um, but for the legits, the doctors who really deal with pain management. They were left in the loop. Why do I have to prove this guy needs pain? I'm a professional doctor. Of course he needs these meds. I shouldn't have to have to prove it. And so the Supreme Court says, you're right. You're the doctor. The state is not the doctor. So good for them. Well, what we see now, there are four, three major and one minor, and there are a few more that are coming, but people tell me are going to come out, that all have the theme of liberty and freedom. Now, how does that apply to Roe versus Wade? Well, it's the liberty of having not having unelected judges make up things on the fly, rather to have the people in the form of their legislature decide what will govern them. It's the same thing with having administrators decide what doctors can and cannot prescribe. It's a freedom. It's a line of freedom. It's the same with the gun law, the first big case, the New York gun case. I got around to reading Clarence Thomas's opinion. He was the lead writer of the opinion there, and he had a line that was just devastating. And he just, he, he raised the Dred Scott case of 1857, which uh, upheld the fugitive slave law, where slaves who escaped from the South and went to free states had to be returned to their slave owners because they were property, not people. And Thomas cited now, people are going to say, oh, Clarence Thomas cites a pro-slavery decision, one of the worst in the U.S. Supreme Court history. Well, what Clarence Thomas cited was not the decision, but one of the arguments that Chief Justice Taney of Maryland offered. He said, if we allow black people who to become free, that means they'll be allowed to carry guns just like you and me. And the, the whole point of the New York law was to uh, keep back those who had the rights to own guns. So if you're a black guy in New York City, sorry, you can't have a concealed handgun. So in other words, Thomas was able to like to turn the liberal talking points on their head that this essentially was a racist law that the liberals over the course of time, because it was passed in 1911, this was a racist law, because uh, at that time we were having blacks moving up from the South to Harlem that the liberals had taken on as their own. Um, just remarkable that the, the liberties that are now being taught and expressed by our well, Supreme I, Court. I would like to put a reverse spin on the Roe v. Wade decision of last week, last Friday. Um, the Supreme Court, in their decision to uh, uh, vacate Roe v. Wade, have made the most pro-choice decision the Supreme Court could have made. I now, as a citizen, have the choice of whether or not I live in a state that supports or funds or has abortion clinics, or I can live in a state where they don't, and I'm not forced to, through my taxes, pay for abortions. I can live in Florida, which I do, I'm a citizen of Florida, um, and I choose to live there because there is more liberty and freedom uh, given to Christians there uh, who have in their... Um, rights package i don't want to pay for other people's abortions i don't want to have abortions available and here's the dirty little secret that happened uh after the decision the pro-choice community found that we did have pregnancy centers and um all these places where you, there was an alternative to abortion and now they're burning them down 
hit 17 so far. It, there's a colossal amount of ignorance on this issue that's not just abortion activists, but government leaders. Yeah. Uh, the, the current Secretary of Defense, he's a retired general. Um, this man is a moron. I hate, and I'm sure he was a good general when he's a general, but as a politician, he's just dreadful. He got he, The Defense Department issued a statement under his signature after this ruling saying they disagreed with it. It's the first time the State Department gets into party politics. That's not supposed to be what they're doing. Yeah. And he says, we at the State Department, the Defense Department, will continue to make sure that a woman's right to an abortion in the military is not curtailed. And if one, should, if a woman wants one, she can get one. Well, why this guy's an idiot is there's a thing called the Hyde Amendment, which forbids government money to pay for abortions. So a woman who wants an abortion can't go to an army hospital because they're not allowed to do it. This guy doesn't even know his own job. And like people are saying that, oh, this will lead to, you know, banning interracial misogynation laws will be brought back or uh, you no longer can use contraceptives and things like that. The, this, the decisions said this applies only the thinking to this issue of abortion. It has nothing to do with uh, interracial marriage or contraception or same-sex marriage, things like that. This deals with abortion, and the arguments are not transferable to these other issues. Mm. But and people are people are so quick on the TV to say, oh, this is the beginning of the slippery slope, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I've, <laughs> I've seen the slippery slope over here in Madison. Now, we now hit that reality that people are realizing since the mid 80s when uh the the pro-life organizations really lost in courts that they said okay we're not going to be able to win this quickly at the supreme court level let's start putting together pregnancy agencies and uh services that we can work at the city level and the and the state level to help people who are pregnant and don't know what options they have and we will provide the ultrasounds we'll provide uh the the care will provide the adoption services will provide uh, the financial services and the, and the food services we will help those in crisis over pregnancy and they've successfully and very abundantly done this since the mid 80s i don't know if you remember when uh, i don't remember the name of the organization but they were brought up on rico charges um you know and, and lost the, all their uh, assets uh, because they were brought up on, on a mob charge it was a uh, some pro-life American family thing, and you know we, we've come a long way, George. We now, uh, as a pro-life or, uh, organizations, practice what we preach. Yes, we're there. The whole point of the, uh, from pregnancy to adoption, if you need us, from pregnancy to uh, providing infant milk, if we need us, providing uh, pregnancy through counseling, whatever you need, uh, these organizations are there, and now they're subject to the violent trends of the, the pro-choice people. Yeah. yeah but Sad they... to watch. Oh, my. Yeah. All right, so we're going to go from, you know, Supreme Court news, very vibrant, very, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, to what is, I'm going to say, just boring news. And when I talk about a province that is boring, that's a good thing, George. And yes, the, and the, there's no controversy there's no uh um he said she said there's no uh uh one bishop putting out a press release against another bishop and i'm talking about the acna they had yeah, a we used to meeting. <laughs> we used to say you know the canadian church was boring but they got a little interesting the past 10 years yeah. but the acna had a boring council meeting uh they oh, affirmed two thumbs up okay the, they affirmed uh, the election of three new bishops. They reviewed the work being done on the Upper Midwest uh, abuse case. And then they talked about, you know, we've had problems with attendance over COVID like everybody else. Everybody else yeah. And so what else happened? I'm sure plenty, but not, not much uh, major earth shattering import. Which you and I are critics of the church when a church comes forth and it's still doing dynamic work, it's still providing 
uh, you know, access to the transformal nature of Jesus Christ. The churches are still doing what they're supposed to do. I'm actually going to an Anglican church here in Madison, Wisconsin, in the next couple of months. It's a wonderful little church in this little college town. You know, I'm talking to the priest. You are working in the hardest ground I've ever seen. He goes, "Yeah, this is Madison." <laughs> so, you know, it, it's wonderful to see these uh, the Anglican Church of North America still fight it out on the tough soil of North America. And yet when we get to their meetings, there's nothing controversial. I like that. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to our next story. Uh, oh, it's been a bad week for the Episcopal Church and presiding Bishop Michael Curry. And we've talked about this before. The Episcopal Church has lost its voice. And for a large part, uh, small c Catholic Christianity has lost its voice because you've lost the uh, the benefit of the doubt. And right now, national churches like the Episcopal Church and the Roman Catholic Church and the Methodists and Lutherans, nobody cares what they think anymore. Nobody seeks out their opinion when it comes to morality matters. And we've had morality come before the Supreme Court. They made their decisions, and Michael Curry put to paper his thoughts, and nobody cares, George. Michael Curry thought this was a terrible decision, and he said, you know, I used to be a priest in inner city Buffalo, I'm sorry, Baltimore, Baltimore. and uh, people there need abortion, which is a horrible thing to say. I can't see how people are advantaged by the killing of their children, but, you know, that's his opinion, I guess. But, you know, had they had a friend of the court briefs on the gun control issue, on the abortion issue. I don't know if they had anything on school prayer, but it really didn't matter because they spent all this money on lawyers to write these friend of the court briefs that nobody cares about. And this is one of the things that's been going on for a long time. Uh, at one time in the history of the church, when the church made a pronouncement on a public policy issue, people paid attention mm -hmm. because it's a rare event. And when they delved into party politics, it was something to take up and listen. You could agree, you could disagree. But this is one of the problems Justin Welby's having, that every time he goes into party politics, it's always on the side of the you know, liberal Democrats, are never on the side of the conservatives. And even though the majority of English uh, churchgoers uh, probably are members, are supporters of the uh, conservative party, their bishops are lockstep supporters of the labor party. And in this country, you know, the bishops by and large are supporters of the Democrats when the Episcopal Church remains, according to the Pew Foundation, evenly divided with, between political conservatives and political liberals. So, you know, whenever a, a, a bishop makes some statement on a political issue, border security, or things like that, when it doesn't really have a direct impact on morality, uh, I think it just diminishes. We, we've mentioned the Ashenden Law the more, more a religious leader talks about politics, the less spiritual uh, <laughs> acumen he has. It's yeah. perfectly true. It's perfectly true experience shows us that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if you, were you watching the comments this weekend, uh, Anglican Scripted? Well, yes, we've got a troll farm. We've got uh, trolls. Growing. <laughs> that's when you you know you made it as a YouTuber when you got trolls. And so, yeah, we got a couple people out trolling us and it's fun. You know, please be gentle and kind-hearted with these people. Uh, we will respond with Christian love. We will respond with wit. Um, but uh, uh, apparently, George and I are fat. And that's not true. George and I are thick-skinned. Okay, T just let, let you know right now, this is the thick skin, which you have to have if you're going to be a person putting your theology and opinions on YouTube. Uh, oh, and we have an affection towards each other apparently so and what yes you, closet I love homosexuals george, according yes. to one commentator <laughs> I, I love george my brother but yeah we've both been mar married 30 years and if we haven't showed any uh same sex lust yet i think that's that's that boat has sailed so all right let's go on to other news bishop of glipson says there is no obstacle for same-sex marriage. If you've not heard of Glipsman, it's not here in America. George, where is it? Gippsland is, uh, is near Melbourne. Yeah. It's in uh, the state of uh, 
Victor Victoria? I, I get these confused. Well, I, th it's, I think it's Bishop Trelore. I'm not certain. Well, please correct me uh, when I, with my mistakes of geography and names. The Bishop of Gippsland uh, recently said that he sees no obstacles for performing same-sex marriages in his diocese. Um, the General Synod did not specifically forbid him from doing it. And the absence of being forbidden is sort of a way of saying it's approved. I can't stop it from happening. And so whether or not this guy goes through with it, uh, I encourage people to look at David Old's blog because he's got great details, including the correct names and locations <laughs> of these locations. people. Um, if Gippsland's goes through with same-sex marriage, then Brisbane and Perth may follow. And when that happens, we're going to have a, I think we're going to see a split in the Anglican Church of Australia between the liberals and conservatives. And it's not that one group will uh, claim the mantle and expel the others, uh, but rather the diocese will each go into one of two camps. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the sex wars will have claimed another casualty amongst the they community would, churches. Because, but here's my confusion in all this. Basically, the laity are conservative. The bishops themselves, uh, in, in one faction, are liberal to ultra-liberal. Uh, yeah. There are conservative bishops on one side, but and but the, the liberal bishops represent conservative laity. Some do, yes. And uh, it was, of course, the bishops who torpedoed the recent uh, General Synod motions on uh, human sexuality, where it pa the conservative viewpoint passed in the clergy and lay houses of the Synod. It was the bishops, of course, who torpedoed it. So, bad, uh, well, bad news for the Anglican Church of Australia, good news for Kevin and George, because they're not going to be boring uh, in the years ahead. <laughs> no, I, and I, to our south, to our south, we may see Mexico, some, yeah. I don't think we've ever done a Mexican story, maybe a Mexican corruption story, but I can't remember a Mexican church political story. I, one or two, but not, not, it's not, does not come in our news feed very often. You go a little further south, you can make our news feed, but uh, Mexico, kind of generic tech wannabes, you know? Well, the province of Mexico has played, played it down the middle on same-sex marriage. They mm -hmm. re maintain relations with the American Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Canada. Uh, even though those churches have uh, gone forward with same-sex marriage, while at the same time they've not allowed it in the Anglican Church of Mexico. So they have a nice to the foreigners, this is how we're doing it at home approach. And the uh, Francis, uh, Francisco Moreno, the last primate, uh, was quite keen on this. We weren't gonna go forward, but we'll be nice to the, the gringos. Well, uh, in June, June 11th, uh, they installed a new primate, uh, Bishop Trevino, and I want to say Lee Trevino, but no, it's not <laughs> no, Lee Trevino, no. the girl. <laughs> Bishop Trevino of Cuernavaca is the new primate, and he's basically said, we're going to continue. Well, at the Synod, uh, the Diocese of Southeastern Mexico, which is sort of the arc from the uh, way down with the border in Honduras, all, at, I'm sorry, to Guatemala, mm -hmm. and all the way up to uh, the Yucatan resorts. Uh, Cesar Martin is the bishop. They, at their synod in February, the Austin Synod, they've asked, they passed a motion asking the National Church to change the marriage prayer book wording from man and woman to these two persons. Yeah, well. And this was brought to the June meeting of the General Synod of Mexico. I think it was the 10th or 11th meeting of Synod. And the Mexican church decided to punt, meaning let's send it to committee. And so they've got three years because they have a three year mm -hmm. uh, general, uh, general convention type structure. So the Mexican church is now going to start because the Mexican laity, I don't think are quite on board, even though there have been gay Mexican bishops in the past, uh, not gay like Gene Robinson, but, but they were known to be. We would go to these at meetings, Kevin and I, and people would say to us, wink, wink, not, not, you know, there's a gay primate here, don't you? Mm -hmm. And uh, stuff like that. But, you know, so Mexico, I don't think is going to be as quick to jump on the bandwagon 
as uh, some other as Brazil, the Anglican Church of Brazil was, for instance. Well, if you but look at Mexico, going to be a battle that's going to unfold. Mexico, uh, the Anglicans down there have competition, the Roman Catholic Church, which, for now, has not uh, gone the same sex marriage route, um, and I think that will kind of you know keep them on their their uh, the filter. And the ACNA Diocese of the Southwest, based out of New Mexico, has, uh, I think, a dozen congregations in northern Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is some competition in northern Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, Bishop Martin in the south has no competition except for the Catholic Church and Pentecostals. So uh, uh, Mexico is going to be interesting in the years ahead because the ACNA is, is growing there. The Anglican Church in Mexico, the official one, has been pretty stagnant and has been suffering through uh, uh, corruption scandals uh, over the past few decades. Mm -hmm. So we'll, uh, we'll see, how, uh, see how these things unfold. It'll be fun. On to our next story. Now, we do stories every week that uh, highlight the necessity for transparency, for giving both sides of a, a news story. And to be fully honest, even though the news can be hurtful, stressful, or put the church in a bad light. You, you got to talk about it. And we talked uh, about Archbishop Stanley Antigali's uh, affair last year. The people, in, some, many of the people in Uganda were initially shocked that we would talk about it. And we, we took some political hits for that. However, you got to do it. You have to be honest and transparent. Otherwise, what's the point of news? What, what's the point of Christianity if you can't have an honest Christianity? And so we now are coming to the end of the saga uh, of the affair. And why don't you give a, a brief synopsis and where we are now, George? Well, the Stanley Intagaga, Intagala, the retired primate or Archbishop of Uganda, mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago was uh, involved in an adulterous affair with a priest's wife. And this was made public by the, art, the current Archbishop of Uganda, Stephen Kazimba. Mm -hmm. And Archbishop Stanley uh, was disciplined. He confessed his sins before the House of Bishops. He accepted his discipline. He reconciled with his wife. Uh, now, so that process has pretty much come to an end. The other side of the coin is divorce court just issued their rulings last week. The other woman in the Stanley and Tagala affair was sued for divorce, and the court granted a divorce decree to the husband. Uh, they were married in 2018, and the woman filed for divorce in 2020 at the start of the of Stanley and Tagala affair, alleging cruelty and abandonment. The husband, a priest who was an instructor, I think at Bishop Barham, or well, he was a theological college instructor, countersued saying, She's had a child in our relationship during the time of our marriage, and I'm not the father. I chose if Stanley's the father. And she's had other affairs. And the court ruled on Friday, yes, she is the guilty party in the marriage. The correspondent person in the marriage, the correspondent meaning the person who, with whom the, the spouse had the affair was Archbishop Stanley. Uh, we find in favor of the husband, and we award the majority of the marital property to the husband and uh, to grant a divorce completely. And the, and this, and the uh, child born during the marriage, the father, the husband, has no legal obligations toward or financial obligations because he's not the father. Archbishop Stanley was. Yeah. So it's now come to a close legally with divorce court issuing their rulings and anybody, all these accusations that oh, we're making it up, we're lying, or this and that, we're now just reading from the court records. Yeah. They may be lying, but we're not lying. Um, and you can't be a news channel without reporting the nitty gritty of some of the bad stuff within the church. Um, and by reporting this in the long run, it is glorifying to the church and to God to have transparency, to have the knowledge of everything that happens, and to know that it's a redeemable situation. God can redeem this. 
He has redeemed parts of this. We've seen a full confession. We've seen people ready to move on. And that's kind of what it's all about. You know, we are all sinners. I'm probably the second most sinner in the in the nation. The first one was taken up by the Apostle Paul. And, uh, you know, yeah, your job is to daily uh, ask forgiveness and, and move on. And I do. Uh, there's so much to forgive. All right. Now, have we done all our stories? Uh, the only thing we haven't touched on is General Synod in the Ukraine, but it really follows last week's discussion on uh, from... Or do you want to just touch on that quickly? Yeah, because we got time. We're, we're at 37 minutes, and a patient audience has sat through. Did you see the comments where everybody's watching the whole thing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Our wives don't watch one minute of Unscripted. And you wonderful audience out there, sit down and gather and you get the kids around the fireplace, and let's listen to Anglican Unscripted. Oh, my Lord. So... Um, <laughs> Well, General Synod has a has a an emergency resolution coming up. They're meeting in New York next month at the Church of England, mm -hmm. and it's a remarkably grown up paper. I really do. I've been uh, harsh on Nick Baines about Nick Baines, the Bishop of Leeds. He's sure. uh, he's a political liberal. He sort of doesn't. I don't walk in his uh, trail, but I have to say the work he's done with this Ukraine motion is really solid. Uh, the motion uh, calls for uh, prayers for the Ukraine, prayers for the end of the war, prayers for negotiated peace. And Nick Baines wrote this detailed paper about the situation there, and he said there are a whole range of options. And we have to start asking ourselves, what is the Christian resolution? Is it a war to the death between Ukraine and Russia? Or is there a, or are there intermediate steps? Now, our aim as a church is to preserve the U integrity of the Ukrainian state and people, but at what cost? It may be worthwhile for the Ukrainians to basically trade away the two provinces to the east that they've already lost, Russian ground troops, um, rather than keep fighting until all the Ru Ukrainian men are dead. Um, one of the big things, and and of course the the secular press in Britain, the Telegraph in particular, hammered uh, Nick Baines, saying he's proposing that uh, they trade land for peace. And no, he wasn't. He was just saying all the list of options. You could just as easily say he was pr uh, proposing war to the death. So it, it was it was good to see a thoughtful, well written position paper on the Ukraine, one that is certainly much better more accurate about the situation on the ground than anything that you hear from our NBC, ABC, CBS, uh, CNN types mm -hmm. of these talking heads of, oh, you, Russia is about to crumble any second now or just, you know, the, they're going to expel Putin. These people have been wrong from the get-go. First, Russia was going to win in three days. Now Russia is just about ready to lose. And Sky News, one of the British uh, TV channels, reported that 80% of the uh, original Ukrainian army, the elite troops, they're all dead in this war. And it's basically pointed out that the Russian strategy has been to basically operate a meat grinder. Russia historically hasn't really cared about casualties. and They're happy to bleed to death the Ukrainians and win that way. Whereas people thought this would be a lightning German blitzkrieg when certainly not been one. Well, when Russia well, invaded Crimea, it was. So, I mean... It, it, yeah. Well, there was no opposition, really. They <laughs> no just opposition, no. It, three I traffic mean, cops said, stop, and they just kept going. <laughs> yeah, war is just devastating on so many levels. And uh, you can't really judge a war until 10 or 15 years after it's over. So you can re investigate what happened and how it happened and what we see now here in the news is cnn and fox and nbc just trying to get people to come to their site and read the articles and they do that by uh, breaking news headlines in fact the new head of cnn says we have to stop using the phrase breaking news not all stories are breaking news well it has been for cnn for the last 25 years but you know that sensationalism we find in journalism makes the fog of war even foggier. We really have no idea what's ha happening right now in Russia and Ukraine, other than people are dying. Yeah, well, and 
we do have an idea of what's happening in the minds of the Russian leaders and in oh, the minds yes, of sure. the Russian. And the problem is that our leadership, I don't think, are reading or paying attention. Uh, I have a, I ha I once read and write Russian. I studied Russian in college, and mm -hmm. I can still sometimes read. Sometimes I can. I got to look up words, and my brain isn't what it once was. The Russians are basically saying our long-term plan is to say to the Poles and the Hungarians, let's divide up the Ukraine. You can take back, you know, Western Galicia and the Hungarians can regain land they lost yeah, to the Russians in 45 and in 1918. Um, and maybe the Poles want to regain the city of Lvov, which they lost to the Russians in 45. Yeah. In other words, there's a lot going on here, whereas all we get on TV is the uh, David and Goliath show of Ukraine and, and uh, of uh, Zelensky and Putin. And there's so much more to it than that. But, well, there is. There's a, a large portion of the leadership of Russia that is still lamenting the loss of the Soviet Union. There's mm -hmm. a, a large portion of... Uh, and But this leadership is seven years from retiring. They're gone. If they don't mm -hmm. do this now, it won't happen. They don't care what their citizens say. Their citizens are protesting quietly in, in the streets here and there, but they, they don't care. This is this. They, they, they don't have a CNN, you know, at, at every march. They, you know, they're fine. Kirill, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, has come under great, pre, uh, great criticism in the West for not uh, condemning the war and for basically, by his actions, appearing to support the government of Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. And the British government recently uh, sanctioned him along with some military leaders and political leaders saying any property of his in London or will be seized. He can't come in, enter the country. He's on the list of bad people. And the Anglican chaplain in Moscow, the uh, rector of uh, St. Andrew's Anglican Church, who's also the Archbishop of Canterbury's representative to the Russian Orthodox Church, Orthodox Church penned a letter saying this is a bad idea because this is not as black as white as it seems. Now, he didn't criticize Carol, but he sort of left, yes, Carol is not uh, squeaky clean, but what are the options? Uh, if, if we're going to cut off our noses and not talk to the Russian Orthodox Church, then we will not be able to influence events. If we keep continuing to talk to Carol and to the other leaders of Orthodoxy, we may be able to salvage something out of this fiasco. But if we start off by saying you're evil and we're turning our backs to you, well, then it's over. So, so it was an interesting, interesting point from the chaplain in Moscow. Yeah. Maybe there was a gun to his head when he wrote it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, you know, back in Soviet times, of course there was. And, you know, list of things to pray for. You know, continue to pray for you know a resolution to the war. Um, we don't want war. Yes, there are just wars. Um, this is not just a war, and so we'll have to see what happens. Keep your prayers. And uh, can I just mention one little thing? This this sure. wasn't recent. This was like last year's a year or two ago. Yeah. People like to say that Carol is uh, not entirely uh, honest, and that uh, it's watch thing. Do you remember that story, Kevin? I'm pointing to yeah. Or are, or are you telling me that? No, hurry no, up, no. Get the, get. <laughs> the Carol watch. <laughs> Carol uh, signed some document, and the photo came out, and he and with his signature hand, he's. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Yes, he's got yeah, a signing, like and he's got his other hand raised, mm -hmm. and he's got a Philippe Patek watch that cost about twenty thousand dollars, gold, solid gold. You know, it, Swiss okay. watch. George, it's more than that. Okay. <laughs> you just <laughs> don't ask how I know, ago. but it's more than that. <laughs> okay. And there was a bit of a buzz, and the watch was airbrushed off of his hand, off of his wrist. Problem was, the reflection of the watch was still left on the polished table surface. So, you know, what is a lead, church leader doing with what? How much do they cost? Kind of twenty, forty, fifty thousand dollars? I don't know. The the Philip watch he had was at least fifty thousand. Yeah. You know, so okay. Well, what yeah. what is he doing? Uh, what is he? What is a man sworn to poverty, chastity, and obedience doing with a fifty thousand dollar gold watch? Well, he they airbrushed be, it off uh, his wrist to make it look better. 
he wants to be sure he's not late and this will help yeah that's true i don't know it's crazy all right so we're continuing our adventures in the rv we're going to start traveling again around uh uh, southern wisconsin as the gas prices have uh, kind of slowed down in their their price increase you are in now i'm looking here we don't talk that often about weather in in depth but florida is hot now yes it's been in the mid 90s for about two weeks now 95 96 but we also have high humidity yeah 90 percent humidity so it's uh, the heat index has been about 110 these past few weeks which I don't particularly mind, except when I have to cut the grass or something. Uh, during the summer, our crew of volunteers who cut the grass and do the lawns and weeding and whatnot, uh, they all go up north to Maine and New Hampshire. <laughs> and so the other day I was, uh, I was cutting the grass at 7 a.m. before it got too hot. Uh, oh, uh, the things that a parish priest does, and here we are talking, Kevin talking about you know, the Supreme Court and Moscow and all these exciting international things. And do you know sure. what I was doing yesterday afternoon? Weed I was blackened. cleaning up. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I, no, in the afternoon it was hot. I was cleaning up with the steam cleaner throw up from the kids party after school, on, after church on Sunday. One of the little boys ate too many cookies and he threw Aww. up and we it sponged it up. But I had to come in with the carpet cleaner to make the, the, uh, ner the classroom presentable and didn't stink <laughs> for next <Yeah>. Sunday. <laughs> This is the stuff a parish priest does. You, you clean up, throw up, you cut the grass, and you talk uh -huh. about deep spiritual things. Well, yeah, the the theology level, the average, you know, Anglican priest, has to be deeper than puke on the floor, you know, and you cover that well. Well, Kevin, I think I think <laughs> that could really be a tagline. I know more than puke, or <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think deeper than puke on the floor. <laughs> deeper than puke. <laughs> George is deeper than puke. <sighs> okay, people, have a good week. Keep us in your prayers. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 739 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> <laughs>